Mesdames et messieurs, euh, chers collègues, euh, chers étudiants, euh, mon nom est Philippe Burin, je suis le directeur de l'Institut. Trois mots en français euh, pour faire entendre euh, la voix de l'indigène et pour vous dire euh, à quel point je suis heureux de vous accueillir ce soir pour cette euh, table ronde euh, qui nous permet d'accueillir euh, notre nouvelle collègue, euh, Gita steiner kamsi euh, Gita est professeure euh, d'éducation à Teachers College à Columbia et euh, elle va euh, officier, professer euh, dans cette maison pendant les prochaines années à mi-temps, partageant son temps entre New York euh, et Genève. Et son arrivée euh, nous réjouit beaucoup parce que Gita Steiner est une grande spécialiste des questions d'éducation avec un domaine de spécialisation géographique qui est l'Asie centrale, mais qui porte par ailleurs de manière transversale sur l'étude comparée des politiques éducatives. Elle a commencé ses études en Suisse, à Zurich, où elle a obtenu son doctorat en psychologie sociale avant de partir aux États-Unis, où elle est devenue professeure ordinaire à Columbia. À l'Institut, outre l'enseignement, elle assurera la direction du NORAG, qui est une, un programme associé à l'Institut spécialisé dans les politiques d'éducation et de coopération en matière éducative et j'aimerais saisir l'occasion pour remercier le directeur de NORAG jusqu'il y a peu, Michel Carton, à qui Gita Steiner va succéder comme responsable de ce programme qui est soutenu par la DDC, la Division de Développement et de la Coopération du gouvernement suisse. Un grand merci à Michel Carton à la DDC, à Jost Monk, qui euh, collabore avec Michel Carton et maintenant va aider notre nouvelle collègue à trouver ses marques dans, euh, à l'intérieur de l'Institut. Elle n'a pas besoin de trouver ses marques auprès de la DDC du gouvernement suisse parce qu'elle travaille comme experte depuis longtemps euh, pour euh, les autorités suisses. C'est donc un grand plaisir pour moi que de lui passer la parole maintenant en nous souhaitant une excellente discussion. Merci du pas. Let me start by reciprocating the thanks, especially to Philippe Burin, but also Michel and Joost for their hospitality and their warmth that they have given uh, when I arrived in February and even the months before when we collaborated. And also I would like to thank uh, Mario Novelli and uh, Nick Burnett, who are eminent scholars in our field, And I'm a bit embarrassed that they have to listen to me for the next 25 minutes before we discuss. I would like to thank them also for giving me this opportunity to speak. We were talking about SDG, and my role is to introduce you to the SDG 4, which stands for Sustainable Development Goal Number 4. And we abbreviated to say that this is the education goal specifically. So I will say a few words about SDG 4 and try to analyze also the kind of issues that I find pertinent in analyzing SDG 4 rather than just describing it. Um, SDGs, there are many goals, 17 in particular. SDG 4 is about quality, education, equitable, inclusive, free, quality education to, com to the end of lower secondary education, which is um, 15 years of age, usually in most countries, which is a big change from before because it used to be up to um, primary school. 
Then there are other targets, many of them actually, two of them are especially important for NORAC, and NORAC has gained a reputation for being the voice of lifelong learning and vocational technical education, which is it's part of SDG 4 in different targets, but it's also connected to SDG 8, uh, the right to good jobs and economic growth, but also number 12, which I think will add to the agenda of NORAG, which is education for sustainable development or responsive consumption, which is a strength of SDC actually, because SDC is very strong on anything related to water, sustainability, agriculture. So we think we can contribute a lot. Just again, uh, this is in introduction. There are seven targets. The targets uh, that deal with, um, again, free equitable education, but also the second one, girls and boys and men and women, parity in education, skills for development, for decent work, etc. Then what is new in the SDGs is that education also pops up as a means of implementation. And there are three specifically. One means is to improve school infrastructure, including ramps and disability, but also inclusive education, learning environment that is child-friendly, gender-friendly, inclusive of minorities. Then uh, scholarships from people from developing countries for uh, TVET, but also universities. I think that's also important for us, for the Graduate Institute in particular. And finally, the Sustainable Development Goal 4C, the importance of teacher quality, which happens to be an area where I have worked a lot in the past. So let me briefly compare. This is from the UIS brochure, the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. It, there are changes. One of the big changes is that it's supposed to be universal, not only for developing countries. We haven't felt that yet, but it is supposed to be a universal sustainable development goals. Um, the move away from only universal primary completion to lifelong learning and equity the move away from gender parity to gender and other groups. That's also an important aspect. And um, the emphasis on measuring indicators. And that's a big change to before. And it's also a big problem compared to before. And actually, the uh, colleagues that are here are experts on that issue. And I'm sure we will talk about it also during the discussion. So let me come to my own analysis of the SDG4. And this is what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that we should also analyze the changing role of the state that occurred between this agenda as compared to the previous agenda, which was the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were in effect from 2000, 2015. And now we have the other next 15 years, the SDGs. And I will refer to SDG4 all the time. There are two, three things that I find noticeable, and I would like to open that for discussion. One is the emphasis on the role of the state as an educator. I would call it the educative state. The emphasis on lifelong learning and equity within that. The second one, the emphasis on measurement or evidence-based policy planning, in this case, outcomes, orientation, and standards. And the, la the next one, which it looks like a French word, but it's not French. It is an English, <laughs> it is an English nomenclature for the fair, fair state that is discussed in political economy and political science. So let me just briefly talk about the ed educative state. It used to be in the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goal, the precursor of SDGs, that education was formal education. It was equated with formal education grades actually one to four, even not before, beyond one to four. It was the focus on formal primary education uh, un so until here, basically. Everything else, everything else was not of interest. 
So what we have now is an expansion to lower secondary in formal education. That's formal education because it shows you know, primary, lower secondary, and then university. This is the ISTED classification of UNESCO to not only expansion of formal education, but also what I would call education for or against. Education and as a panacea for all kinds of social problems. Up to, you know, for terror, for youth unemployment, for uh, extremism and terrorism, for lack of family planning. So education as a means has really taken on a monumental role at least on paper in the SDG 4. And one of the things that we did in the evaluation for the Swiss um, Agency for Development and Cooperation, when we looked at the global evaluation of their programs, we saw that uh, basic education has a big part of the portfolio, but what really increased is the role of education, not only in the formal sector or STC also does a lot of adult education and informal education, but in food security, in uh, health, in other sectors that are completely unrelated. And as you know, as you know maybe that in the, the, the program office they have to identify is education a first priority, second or third. So what we noticed that education as a second or third priority really increased within the Swiss agency, at least in the last 10 years. And for us, it's good, but it's also a problem because there's a lack of professional knowledge on education in those sectors. They do education, but I would say they don't do it maybe professionally enough. So this is the educative state composed of three aspects. One is school and training, uh, SDG4, but also swamps over to SDG 8. Then this education has a panacea for all social problems. Education for or against global citizenship, education for sustainable development, youth violence and extremism. And this is Mario's topic actually uh, on youth violence and extremism and fragile education in fragile states. And then the third one is the expansion of education, not only formal education and um, education in a broader context, but also more groups. So there is a real ambition to really get at the last 5% that uh, students with disabilities, students that are excluded because they're indigenous, because they're bilingual, because they live in remote rural areas. So this is Again, on paper at least, a new commitment that didn't exist before. The, whole, the second point of analysis for discussion is the new role of the state moving away from being the provider of education to the standard setter and regulator. And as part of the standard setting and regulation, um, there are all these benchmarks that are being developed for measuring whether the outcomes satisfy certain benchmarks. And this is part, you know, this has been going on in education. Some people call it neoliberal reform, some call it new public management. It, nowadays, people also refer to it as public private partnership in education as one of the manifestations of that move. But basically, Got we, what we call in sociology of education, governance by numbers. You don't govern directly, you don't control directly, you don't provide education directly, but you have benchmarks, you have standards, and the state's role is to regulate, and actually as part of this regulation, to accredit or not accredit, to fund or not fund. So this is what you see, the first exercise, in my opinion, that happened in 2002, this was the first time where we had this kind of indicative framework in education, where the World Bank at that time looked at 155 developing countries, analyzed those that are so-called on track, came up with a whole list of things that matter to the World Bank, such as how much money, 
how much money do successful poor countries spend on education, such as Bangladesh, for instance? Um, and how much do they spend in primary, on primary level? It should be, and so this is, there's a very brief path from analyzing a problem to prescribing something. So, it, so what they came up with, that it should be between 42 to 64 percent of the total recurrent spending on education should be spent in primary education. So this become, became almost like a prescription. So any country that got a loan or a grant was supposed to uh, at least look at those numbers and review them for their own sector planning. Or another one, the average annual remuneration of primary school teachers in developing countries should be 3.5, the average income in the country. And so on, and so on to, down to this detail that the annual instructional hours for students in school should be 850 hours. So I'm just showing you how prescriptive these indicative frameworks were that then led to this whole practice of using so-called best practices. So this then became best practice, a blueprint that you know, countries and governments, for a while at least, were supposed to follow. Um, let me continue with this 13 years later, SDGs, still the evaluative state. Um, one of our colleagues, Kenneth King, is adamant, and rightfully so, about how things get lost in operationalization or translation. So one of the indicators, for example, in the SDG 4 is that by 2030, ensure that all girls and boys complete free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education, leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. How do you translate that into measuring? Very banal. It becomes very banal, actually. So everything that was like really meaningful and important, such as free education, disappears because it's difficult to measure. It's, just, it, it, it's not a matter of lack of political will. It's just difficult to measure because there are so many uh, factors of how to assess free education. Um, it's not only what, whether admission is free, but also whether you have to pay for uniforms or all these unofficial fees, etc. The other thing that is difficult to measure is relevant education. So everything that is difficult to measure becomes anathema. So at the end, you end up having a proportion of children and young people at those different grade levels who achieve at least a minimum proficiency in reading and math. So these are one of the worries that we are having. The same with definition of decent work and relevant skill ends up being measured of how many uh, youth are enrolled in vocational technical education. So these are part of the problem with the evaluative state that are being discussed. We have this evaluative state um, issue already in OECD countries, you all know PISA, and you all know TIMS and PEARLS and others. And you also maybe know the fight between the two, because it's an interesting situation where OECD, which I just yesterday was in Paris as a discussion for Andrea Schleicher, uses actually a global measurement for assessing students' knowledge with the argument that nowadays it's about competencies. And it's not necessarily about the curriculum in the country, whether it has been taught correctly and whether students have learned something. So it's about what students can do and not what they know. This is the move. So this is the OECD way of measuring 15-year-olds in math, science, and um, uh, reading plus an innovative other subject. The IEA way of doing is to look at the national curriculum, what are students supposed to learn, and what do they learn. So there is now a turf fight going on in our field, an interesting one, politely carried out and not spoken about, but basically it is with 
with this evaluative state coming forward as the SDGs, both organizations are expanding their scope of influence, leading to um, not only countries taking both tests, but eventually uh, trickling down to students taking more and more tests at earlier grade levels. Um, I just showed you that example of OECD PISA results of 2015, the so-called what we really detest are these leaked tables because it reduces the complexity of data to which country is performing best. Yesterday in his presentation, I was suggesting to him that he should make a leak table of which country is the most equitable, then you would have Vietnam coming up there. Because in Vietnam is an education system where students from low socioeconomic countries do exceptionally well. Much better than Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Taiwan, what have you. So you can do leak tables as you please depending on what qual uh, criteria you use. This one uses only student performance. But this is part of the evaluative state uh, measuring learning outcomes. And I will, in my own writing and research, I look a lot at the relationship between standardization in education, standardization in learning outcomes, in competencies, and the growth of the education industry. Because once you standardize education and you have standardized learning outcomes, it has obviously become very interesting for businesses to come in because you have an economy of sale, scale. They can sell the textbook, the teacher training program, not only to a small group, but to a large group of schools and students and countries. So this is part of the issues that we are dealing with. And I hope we will have time to discuss the growth of the education industry, especially in developing countries. Uh, let me move to the last point on the evaluative state. I already mentioned the first one, the left side, that the change in the government's role from being the provider of education to one that sets standards and benchmarks, then encourages other providers to come in, makes contracts with non-state actors. This can be NGOs in developing countries or businesses and then make sure it has an evaluation and monitoring system in place. Those of you who work in development work, you know that donor after donor is investing in so-called AMIS. This is like a huge, it's like a, it's endless funding goes there and then the computers break down and there's a new generation that comes in. It is all about education management and information system because of that type of governance that we have in education because govern it's governance by numbers and by benchmarking and by standard setting. We have an interesting dynamic here that's also uh, has triggered interesting research that the standards are developed nationally yet they use global blueprints more and more with PISA coming in but education is paid locally, and uh, the evaluation is done globally, such as global monitoring reports. Every international organization has uh, its own monitoring instruments where they monitor national outcomes. The last one, the last role that I find interesting to discuss, this is from a publication of Vivian Schmidt. She looked at the relationship between the government and the market and differentiates these kinds of interaction between laissez-faire where the government doesn't regulate at all and lets the markets do to fair which is do in place of market actors does not allow the markets to do anything to fair avec and fair fair so what we have right now is a state, and also reflected in the SDG4, where the government encourages the businesses to come in and to work in education and to provide education. So this whole discussion that we have 
not only in OECD countries, but now more and more with low fee private schools also in developing countries on school vouchers and school choice. It's all about fair, fair encouraging businesses to come in. And there's, of course, many, many debates about what that means to equity and equal access to education. Uh, fragile states, part of this discussion of the fair, fair state is the belief that states are weak. And I would say critically, if they are not weak, part of the discourse of fragile state is almost like making them weak. Uh, making them weak, and now if you look at the map, most countries are either yellow or orange. The number of fragile states is growing, which means also the number of states entitled to development funds and specific program is growing. And basically what it means in practice is it circumvents the states, as the, the government as the main actor in development work, and it invites NGOs to come in and others to act on behalf of governments. Um, maybe I should finish with the last slide, something that I also noticed as part of the three points that I want to make. When I was teaching my class two weeks ago when I started, I, was, I noticed that nobody knows the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, which is for us the Holy Bible in development studies because it defines how important it is to give aid in ways where the national government, the recipient government has ownership, where there's alignment with the reform of the country, where the donors harmonize rather than everyone you know, pulling in another direction, where data matters, but also mutual accountability. This is not a reflection of the Graduate Institute, but it is a reflection that that discussion on aid effectiveness and the partnership between recipient government and donor government in bilaterally somehow got lost. And I noticed that it used to be monitored, OECD, DOC, the Development Assistance Committee, would put up all the monitoring reports about how countries and donors did in terms of aid effectiveness. And I noticed after Busan, which was in the year uh, 2011, it lost its importance. And nobody, we, didn't, we don't analyze enough how this happened and why this happened. What I think, but I'm not sure, it's because new donors came to the table that I would call unruly. They couldn't care less about aid effectiveness, about this kind of contractual arrangements, because they have their own regulations, such as philanthropy in education, corporate social responsibility, global education industry, but also the new donors, the BRICS countries. They have their own standards, their own ethical views, or their own views of education that does not correspond with the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. So for these three reasons, for, for this reason, I think the whole aid effectiveness discussion, which was basically our professional code in development studies in, and education, somehow dissipated. So having said that, I think I should stop here. These are the three points I wanted to bring over for the discussion about the changing role of the state as reflected in the SDG form. And with this, I would like to pass the floor to my dear colleague, Joost Monks, the Executive okay. Director. Thank you very much, Gita. I forgot to make... Okay, thank you very much for, for joining this event here today. We're very pleased to co-organize this event with the Graduate Institute as NORAC. And I would like to seize the opportunity indeed to, to thank Mr. Burin again for the very strong support and commitment for making this happen. And of course, Michel Carton has been very important in having Gita here today and having this sort of inaugural event uh, here this evening. And we're very pleased to see this high turnout. I don't want to talk much, uh, I mean, my name is Joost Monks. I'm the executive director of NORAC. 
and I'm pleased to be also an alumnus of this institute, gravitating around it for almost 30 years now. Uh, but I would like to uh, briefly present the two distinguished speakers that we have had, that we have the pleasure of welcoming here, and which both are members of our consultative committee, and we're meeting tomorrow, so that's a very good coincidence. And then I would like both gentlemen to briefly react to Gita's uh, presentation, see how you see this evolving or changing nature of the state in our education and training space uh, before proposing two questions that will guide our panel discussions. I would really like to keep at least 15 minutes uh, for discussion, so with your permission, I'll be pretty sharp on, on, on time. So first, uh, Nick, uh, thanks again for coming uh, from, from Washington, but you had other business to do on this part of the world. Nick is a senior fellow now at Results for Development in Washington. He's a special professor of international education at Nottingham University and chair, and that is an important role, of the board of the UNESCO's International Institute for Educational Planning, amongst others. He now focuses especially on pragmatic and innovative approaches, so that's why we're very keen to listen to him today, to important but neglected topics in our education space, uh, including especially out of school, children, adult illiteracy, innovative finance, and non-state education, and the provision of global public goods. So uh, welcome again, and thanks for joining, Nick. Next, Mario Novelli, um, our scientific advisor also, our scientific NORAC advisor. Uh, he's a professor of political economy of education and deputy director of the Center for International Education, the University of Sussex. <laughs> His research explores the relationship between education, globalization, and international development with a particular focus on education and conflict and global governance. So with that backdrop and without extending much more on, on the CVs, I would like to ask both gentlemen to briefly uh, re reflect on uh, the presentation, the opening presentation that was pro proposed by Gita steiner -Hamzi. Nick, may I ask you first? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. So um, it's a bit difficult to reflect in three minutes or something on quite a, some very, these very interesting points that Gita has made. So let me um, reflect in a way by saying what I think she didn't say that uh, I would have said, um, <laughs> which is not to say that I necessarily disagree with what she did say, but I think there are some things that, that are not there that we, that we ought to pay attention to. So, um, and part of her point was, of course, to compare the SDG or SDG 4 with what came before in, uh, for education and under the MDGs, and we could also say under the Education for All movement. And there's a lot of good changes, several of which she pointed out. For instance, the attention to equity. Um, uh, many people would have also said some, the, the attention to learning, not just to getting children into school. And uh, a, lot, a lot of people are also very heartened by the fact that for the first time uh, inter uh, international goals include something about early childhood. So that there's a lot of positive things. But there's some problems, I think, with, this, with these SDGs. And um, unless we do something about those problems, I think that they, they are not likely to have much uh, impact, which would be rather unfortunate. The first is they're just, uh, on the one hand, we've got these extra things now included. Great. On the other hand, she didn't actually put up SDG 4, but it goes on and on and on, and it is just very long and has many, many things in it, and it's not at all specific. So that is a real problem, and you saw already suggest there are 43 indicators, okay, 11 of them global and others not. Um, but basically, there, it is perfectly feasible to overstate my case slightly to make it, it is perfectly feasible for a government to do whatever it was doing before and say that it's complying because it's so general. Uh, the second point is that it's not feasible. Uh, what a key target is that everybody should uh, have completed, uh, you saw that quote from Ken King, uh, free something or other, secondary education by, by uh, 2030. Well, for that to happen, every child would have to be in school today. And every child is not in school, uh, in primary school. Every child is not. So that is also a very important point. And attached to that is the fact that I think this attention to access has got lost. And uh, uh, the fact that there are 263 million children not in school, 
That is a lot of children. Um, 63 of them at primary level, that's 7 8% still of the global population group. The fact that they're uh, officially about 800 million and unofficially about 1 billion adult illiterates, that is a lot of people who are just not getting attention with all these other things. Um, so these are, I think, some of the uh, things that really would ideally be, uh, should be uh, in, in included. And, but my biggest worry is this fact that I think that they, it is not really enforceable because it is so broad and also, which we might want to come back to discuss, um, because there aren't really any clear um, accountability mechanisms. Um, there are mechanisms for uh, having indicators, there are mechanisms like the Global Education Monitoring Report for having uh, numbers, but there's not really any mechanism for holding governments or uh, states uh, or, or education ministers or whoever accountable. Thank okay, you. thanks, thanks, Nick, as a first reaction. And we'll get back to, to you in the second round of questions that I will propose to the panel. Mario. Yeah, thanks, Gita. Um, I think that, I mean, what, what would be helpful, I think, to when, when we reflect a little bit on education is, is to kind of fill in a little bit of the, the historical background that surrounded the creation of the MDGs and that surrounds the creation of the SDGs. Things have changed politically. Uh, if you think about the MDGs at the turn of, you know, 19, 1997, 1998, when they started working on these, you're talking about a period after the collapse of the Soviet Union where there was a level of optimism and a level of enthusiasm for cooperation uh, in the field of development, um, which contrasted with the divisions that existed during the Cold War. No, when we had the world divided into two blocks and a lot of international development assistance was directed politically according to which block uh, you, were, you were part of. And I think that the best intentions that led to the creation of the M MDGs uh, starts to kind of collapse after 9-11-2001 uh, and I think deteriorates further in 2008 and I think there is something that you can ask around why the Paris Agreement is not uh, is not functioning very well because I mean I remember at the time I was working for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs or in a partnership with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I was at the University of Amsterdam uh, at the time the Dutch uh, 2006 when I arrived the Dutch were spending 20 percent of their development assistance budget on education do you know how much the Dutch spend now? Zero. Yeah? So they've gone from the biggest donor to the, the, the not spending anything on that. And there used to be lots of talk about like-minded donors. If the Dutch are not in one place, it doesn't matter. The, the Danes will represent them. They'll pull the funds. There was a whole discourse around the pooling of funds and this kind of thing. And it seems to me that for security, and for economic crisis, the logics of state, so it's about state theory, but in a slight way uh, different, that states have again reverted to their own interests. So before, in the Paris Agreement, there was part of this idea was the Dutch are good in education, the British are good uh, in health, uh, and each one will play to their strengths and we will work together in harmony. But now everybody wants to worry about security, they want that as their priority because they want to protect their citizens and they realize there is a relationship between underdevelopment somewhere else and security elsewhere. And then after 2008, the financial crisis, citizens in all of the donor countries are starting to ask the question is, where's our money going? What's in it for us? So you have two choices. Either you say it's for your business or for your security. So this has become the discourse and whether Sometimes maybe it's just done to keep the populations quiet, that they say that they're doing it for business, or they say it's, they're doing it for security, but it has its effects. And I think that that's why the goodwill seems to have been lost now. And so this, there is a problem of, uh, of working together now. And then there is, of course, the evolution of capitalism mm -hmm. during that period, which I think is where you're working on, where we've seen a range of experiments for the last 30 years on neoliberal 
what we called the Washington Consensus, then we had the post-Washington Consensus, and now we're in a kind of post-Brexit Trump era where we're not quite sure where the we'll politics of the economics is going, but we feel there is a different challenge. No? So I would say that the, the, it's, it's not a very propitious mm -hmm. period for cooperation, for solidarity, for many of the founding principles of, uh, that many of us share if we are working in international development. Okay, thank you, Mario. Well, basically, you, you basically started the, the, the discussion already now, but you know, to give us some, some guidelines in, in, in the panel discussion that we would like to have for the coming 30 minutes, um, indeed, I mean, the SDGs are there, 117 SDGs, 169 targets, I don't know how many indicators. It's quite a Christmas tree, or in French, some would even call it a usine à gaz. Um, the fact it is, it is a, f a global frame of reference, and all the donors, the, the, the bilateral or the multilaterals, refer uh, to the SDGs, so they become part of our, our debate. So the question I wanted to raise to this distinguished audience, and you've started to answer part of it, is to say, so, okay, so what's new and what's different about the SDGs? What makes it exciting or not? And, and two, and that also relates a little bit to your presentation, Gita, is, okay, in this new education and training space, uh, what are the new actors? Um, and with what kind of agendas? Is it the private industries that are taking on a very strong interest in the standardization uh, business of education? Is it the philanthropics? So what's the changing landscape uh, around the SDGs or more broadly in our education space? So I'd like to ask you to shed some light on this and I'd like to Start with the gentleman and give you the last word, Gita. Would that be fine? Nick, you want to kick this off? Okay, thank you. That's uh, quite a broad question. Um, so let's uh, just focus maybe on a few uh, important new actors at both uh, developing country level and at international level. So I think that the most important shift, uh, which Gita sort of already referred to, in the, in the countries, is the emergence of um, these so-called low-fee private schools. I don't myself think that the most important shift is the emergence of these chains that she referred to or that she mentioned. I think it's the emergence of very large numbers, thousands and thousands of individual proprietors. And you see that especially in uh, urban India. You see that increasingly in urban Africa. Um, and why is this happening? Um, because, uh, well, for many reasons, but in part because parents are uh, not happy with what is provided by the state, uh, or indeed with what is not provided by the state in some places. So you see, uh, again, a lot of this growth uh, in areas where actually there still is very little public education, such as peri-urban uh, Africa. So um, I think that is a, uh, regardless of what you think about markets and ideology and all that sort of thing, I think this is a very important uh, phenomenon that we need to uh, take uh, account of. And whether the response is that the public sector should react to that by improving its own offering, that would be one perfectly good reaction, or whether the response should be that we should figure out positive ways to regulate these uh, schools, many of which, by the way, are, or most of which, by the way, are legally structured as for profit, but are not really like, uh, except for those big chains, which surely, surely are after major profits. Uh, most of them are just sort of, you know, some guy who used to be a teacher in a public school and who actually decided to set up a, his, own, his own or her own school. So that's what I think is the most important I I thing at the country level. What I think is the most important um, internationally. Um, is uh, some, uh, the emergence of some of these uh, uh, new, new actors that to, whom, to which Gita referred, such as the kind of international testing regimes, and I quite agree with her uh, about that. Um, though I, it's important to note that all of those regimes are uh, not testing individuals, by the way. They're testing uh, sam on sample basis, so they're, they're not, it's not like every child in the world is taking PISA. Um, but I think it's the failure so the broad, there is, there are also, there's, I think there's emergence, emergence of some other uh, sources of finance that she did not mention, uh, such as some of the um, Gulf countries uh, becoming quite important. 
Um, it's uh, the um, it, it, but it's, it's not, to my mind, really, frankly, the emergence of these new actors, because when you add it all up, the corporate social responsibility, you add all that up, it's under, it's under 500 million a year, as far as we know. Uh, if you add up all the foundations, uh, what's happening in, in education, unless we're missing something, it's the same order of magnitude. So maybe we've got a billion dollars of extra money, where you've still got um, 10, 11 billion dollars of uh, official aid. So I actually think the biggest uh, problem is, the biggest issue is, is, if, is the existing uh, institutions and their um, continued inability, frankly, to collaborate effectively. Um, I can elaborate on that later, perhaps, if you want. But I mean, you have the World Bank, you have the Global Partnership for Education, you have UNICEF, you have a new Education Cannot Wait Fund to, for Education of Refugees, um, and, and so on. You have UNESCO. And uh, basically, you have a non-functioning multilateral system in uh, education. And you used, didn't say but in introducing me, but I used to work for both the bank and UNESCO, and I find this is uh, very, uh, very worrying that uh, still we cannot get an effective functioning uh, international system, whether it's about norms, whether it's about finance, <coughs> whether it's about um, <coughs> assessment or, or what have you. So. Oh, th thank you very much. That was to the point. Uh, Nick. Mario. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess just elaborating a bit more on, in a sense, in 2017, education is a global business. Um, probably for the last 40 years, uh, education has primarily been seen as a mechanism through which economies can expand. So the idea that you, you study and you have an education and that converts itself into both higher salaries for you as graduates, um, but also higher economies, higher GDPs. That was the kind of logic that dominated the 1980s, 1990s. And I think that in parallel to that has emerged the opening up of the education system as a global market where education services are traded, universities go global, uh, there are markets opening, all the way down to low fee private schools for the poorest, those that are paying five or six dollars or ten dollars a, a month in school. So um, it's both business and means to generate business. No? So that kind of area I think um, is new in the sense that it's a trillion dollar business and it's important. Um, Gita is a, a specialist on this area and uh, I don't want to, to go too far. So I'm going to talk about the second area which I think has changed, which is the intersection between conflict and education. So we've got on the one hand capitalism and education, but also uh, over the last uh, decade or so, um, education's relationship to conflict has changed in, the, in a number of ways. And maybe some of them we just realized, and they existed all the time. But, uh, for example, in 1990, uh, in Jomtien, the first education targets were set, which became later the education MDGs and still have their life uh, up to the present, which we call the Education for All Objectives. And uh, they were critiqued for focusing on uh, too much on access and not enough on quality, but uh, a decade after uh, they were, uh, they were, the agreement was signed in, in Jomtien, uh, in Dakar, in the follow-up, uh, what they discovered was that um, the speed of uh, getting all kids into school was not as fast as they'd hoped, but also that over half of the kids out of school lived in conflict-affected contexts. So there was an issue that began to say, so what is different about countries that are in the midst of violent conflict and how do you deliver education services? Now, I think that's different in the sense that a whole industry has emerged uh, since 2000, interagency network on education in emergencies, massive amounts of funding that have gone towards education in fragile and conflict-affected states. Our conference is now often dominated uh, by people working in this area. 
um, which has started to grapple with a range of issues, delivery education to refugees, uh, how do you uh, deliver education during war, after war, and also in what ways could education become a preventative mechanism? How could education help to stop the outbreak of wars? Um, so education came in through this process. But education has also come in because after 9-11, madrasa education was targeted and, 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 and accused of being responsible for the production of terrorists that led to the, uh, the bombings in New York and subsequent bombings. And there were some wild stories around the Pakistan in particular of the massive amount of students going to radical madrasas um, which led to the production of a whole generation of people that were hating uh, the West. So that was the discourse. The reality was much more mixed and madrasas are a mixed bag and it's much more complicated than that. But discursively, that was a very powerful argument. Secondly, because of the invasions of Iraq, Afghanistan and a range of other, education became discursively very important also for the West. The West started arguing that they were in Afghanistan because of girls' education because of gender issues. So education became very politicized, which meant that it was also started to become targeted by different uh, fighters. So uh, Malala Yousaf is one of the most famous victims of that. No, the Nobel Prize winning uh, Pakistani girl who fought for the rights for girls to go to school and was subsequently attacked by Taliban forces in northern uh, Pakistan. And so Education has become very politicized and caught up in the 9-11. And that has expanded actually now because now there is this whole issue around radicalization and why are people becoming radicalized. And the school is the epicenter of much of the counter-terrorism activity. For example, in the UK, teachers are now statutory responsible for identifying signs of radicalization amongst their students. That means they are legally responsible for identifying whether there are children in their classroom who are becoming radical. The school is becoming an institution of surveillance whereby teachers are there to spot signs of radicalization. And there is many crazy stories about what's going on in the UK. Uh, and as often, some of the worst things that happen in the UK then get exported elsewhere privatization being one of the earlier uh, things. So um, I think that what we're seeing uh, is education's security side or social cohesion side becoming manifested much more. So in a sense, you've got these two things. On the one hand, a kind of global capitalist system that is clearly in <laughs> crisis and is looking to find its way out through deepening or spreading markets in new domains. And then on the other hand, a world that's in crisis, increasing inequality that is driving the production of conflict, and education is caught up in both of those in quite interesting uh, ways. Okay, that's, in, that's an interesting point, Mario. We will, this is, you want to leave it here? Okay, and then we'll get back in the discussion. We'll open the floor for discussion and questions later. Yes, Gita. Can I say something to um, you can, my two? It's, it's your can turn. I? It's can your I? turn. It's your turn. Okay. Uh, you have 10 I minutes. Whoa, if that's you want. too much. Even. So um, I completely agree the importance of seeing the current development since 2002 as part of the war on terror. Mm. And uh, you wrote about it. and. This is a big change to before the 90s where the Cold War was the main driver of both in terms of target countries that were chosen, but also the aid selectivity and all that. And especially for international Geneva, that matters a lot because the war on terror was also the time that brought back American money to the UN system until I think two years ago when on the Palestine war where they withdrew again. And there are things that we don't even remember. For instance, the term youth bulge, that was a big topic uh, five, six, seven years ago. The idea that you have, because of social demographic changes in societies, but also unemployment of youth, especially of male youth, this readiness for violence, 
this kind of studies we don't even have anymore. But it, I, our field is extremely vulnerable to trends and to discussions. They come and they go and they dominate our field. And we, um, it's very closely linked to political um, developments. So I can see on one hand this whole discussion in the direction of fragile state that we don't like to talk about the war on terror, but this is what it is, really. It is just the next step of the war on terror, uh, defining countries in terms of their readiness to violence and extremism in many countries and their post-conflict state of affairs. The other point I wanted to make, and I'm glad that you mentioned that political context of how aid has changed. So the 1990s in re retrospect, was like the peaceful era. It was not the Cold War period, and it was also not the war on uh, it was not the war on terror. It was the period where we had this move towards professionalization of development studies and development in many parts of the world. Um, the one point I want to uh, pick up is on law fee private schools, and I think we disagree, and it's fine to disagree, Nick and I, on this issue. Um, that the law fee private schools, the way I see it, it is a business, even though it may start in many countries as the one teacher school that you have in mind that is very much community driven, community based. It's a multi grade school with committed teachers, actually, because they are from the community. They speak the mother tongue of the students. But what we have, because of the business conglomerate at the same time moving in into third world countries or developing countries, these one teacher schools may become chains. So that's a new development that in Punjab, Pearson is moving in to help organize them or to take over the management of uh, these former one teacher schools. Another example is BRAC. BRAC is the mother of all NGOs for us. We love BRAC. BRAC was for us the example of the best NGO that existed in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh. Yes. It was really driven by the community. It was grassroots. BRAC invited Pearson to do a business plan for them because they're also moving to, uh, towards a more business model and to a fee structure, asking for fees for enrollment. So these are new developments, even those that started out as community-based, very often supported by uh, international donors, and then became, you know, continued on their own. They now move and collaborate with businesses. But of course, we have, again, those businesses that are businesses from the get-go that uh, don't register because because they want to make a profit, there are too low standards to even register with the state. They have teachers that are not qualified, that read from a tablet what instructions they should give to students. Those, those are the ones that I have in mind. But, but of course, there are the other ones that are community-based that are now tempted to become, to collaborate with businesses and being absorbed by businesses. And DEFIT provides money for that. DEFIT gives money for collaboration with, in Punjab, the, uh, the, uh, the roadmap in Punjab was, you know, designed by Sir Michael Barber with the minister of Punjab, and the money does go for collaboration with businesses. Right, okay. So, gentlemen, Gita, thank you very much for, the, for this, uh, brief to the point presentations. Before I open the floor, actually, I take the privilege of being the moderator of asking you a question. Namely, basically, you were sketching out a, an education and training system. I'd like to talk us a little bit more about vocational education. Otherwise, Michelle will raise the point, I'm for sure. Um, like the double squeeze between securitization in our in in aid business and marketization. So the picture you're depicting here is, is quite grim. Uh, I think that the message of the SDG was hope, uh, even if it was like, you know, overextending basically in the SDG, fee, SDG 4, covering the whole spectrum from early childhood to lifelong learning, basically stretching it too much. But 
where is the hope? You know, what's the way out or what's the middle way? Of course, there is not one answer, but I would like us to convey also a positive message here uh, to see how education, which is also recognized within the whole SDG debate as one of the vectors for sustainable development, an element that runs across the sustainable development goals. How can we make sure that education continues to, to provide that hope uh, and, and, and to function as a, as, as a sector, not an economic sector, maybe also an economic sector, but a sector that, that helps to build capacity, uh, train uh, our people, our youngsters, um, to become responsible citizens of our society. So some hope, please. Who wants to start? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll okay. do it. Gita, please. I can start. I mean, let me talk about formal education, not about education for or against. I think it's a real progress to move away from universal primary completion as the main goal to open it up in both directions, to early childhood education, to compulsory, but also <laughs> TVET and also university, because if we talk about scholarships, the scholarships are also for university and TVET. I worked in Central Asia and Mongolia. It was such an insult for them that they had to redefine their problems as if, as if they had problems in primary school, only to get international money. But they had you know, other kinds of issues. So this is, for me, a big uh, move forward to acknowledge that developing countries also have universities, also have TVET, and also have uh, higher learning, not only primary. OK, maybe just TVET stands for Technical and Vocational Education and Training. Mario, now I want your yeah, it, positive star. It's, 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 it's not a good time for somebody that lives in Britain to be optimistic. We're going through <laughs> some difficult times, and uh, um, some things we never expected to happen are happening. So probably that clouds one's vision. And then I just spent three weeks in the United States, and it didn't get any better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so probably it's not good, the right Good you're in Switzerland me. now. <laughs> it's good I'm in Switzerland now. I mean, I thought, if you'd have asked me a couple of years ago, OK, I would say there is a good sign. For the first time, the issue of inequality has entered the mainstream debate. The OECD, the IMF, a range of different in, in, international organizations were talking about inequality. Uh, Piketty's... Uh, uh, amazing book uh, became a bestseller, and it's a quite dry book uh, uh, and, and thick. Uh, I even reviewed it, uh, and uh, I think that um, at that time I was thinking that well, maybe people are waking up to the fact that we live in an incredibly unequal uh, world, and this is bad for both the poor and the rich because the rich are living in gated communities, there is rising crime, there's a range of issues, and I thought that that was where we were going. But I was wrong. Uh, people see other solution, to blame refugees, to blame the poor, uh, to accuse uh, all the countries that are receiving aid now that they are uh, using it in corrupt ways, etc. That seems to be the debate that's going on now, so it's difficult for me to be optimistic uh, in this particular moment. That's not to say that the architects of the SDGs or the agents who are acting inside institutions are responsible for that. Yeah? I think that that's the inter intersection between the political actors, our political leaders, and uh, some of the institutions that we've created, like the United Nations, that has you know, many committed individuals that have given up their lives to do public service and many people inside states. So the fact that many of them are still around, although uh, as we talk, uh, the US uh, State Department is being gutted and many institutions I'm sure are being gutted. Um, but I think that, you know, we hope that there is some institutional memory and some continuation in some of these institutions that can push forward this. But it's a bit like, in a sense, you, you have a political agreement. In 1990, we had education for all. It was a very broad set of targets. It got reduced to gender equity and universal primary education <coughs> in 10 years. Why? For political reasons, yeah? So it's not surprising that SDG started big. Everybody's happy. Everybody shakes their hands, uh, each other's hands. And then suddenly, it becomes narrowed down quite quickly, because the political realities 
start to change that. Was that optimistic enough? <laughs> well, we'll hit it in the questions. Nick, so, um, Nick, so, yeah, I your chance. It's inevitable, in, you know, if when, we ha when, when you have your new professor who wants to make a mark, that you want, want to make some criticism. But, but, uh, um, but, and it's inevitable we would want to as we're reacting. But, I mean, if you actually put yourself in, in the uh, shoes, assume she has shoes, of a poor girl in the developing world, her prospects of being educated were never, were never better. So there has been enormous progress. Of course there are problems that still need attention, but there has been enormous progress, and that continues. Uh, if you uh, look at the spending, uh, the, the you know, most spending on uh, education, which of course is not by uh, aid or by international actors, it's by uh, governments, 97% or so, you see that um, uh, so very interesting patterns happened even during the uh, recession. I mean, not, not a very clear pattern, frankly, but you did not see um, education losing out in any big way uh, in its share of public spending. You did see some problem of public spending as a whole falling, and therefore education, maybe some of its levels falling in some countries, but you didn't see its share being, being attacked. Uh, or being reduced. So I think there was a fairly, fairly good acceptance by governments of very, very <coughs> different types about the need to uh, keep that sort of uh, spending up. And so I think, so there's a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, I think, re reasons for, for optimism. I mean, basically you never had a better chance if you're a poor kid. It's still not a great chance, but you never had a better chance. Secondly, the governments have kept the funding up. Okay. Thank you very much. I would like to open the floor for some questions and comments. <laughs> I would take three questions at a time and just briefly just say uh, who you are, uh, what your background is, whether you study here or somewhere else. Um, let's take three. I have one question here, one there, and three, one, two, three to start off. The gentleman in, in with, okay, the gentleman over there, where's the microphone? Just wait for the microphone, please. It's coming. Thank you very much. OK, uh, my name is Philip O'Brien. I used to work for UNICEF. I'm now president of the International Montessori Association. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I have two really quick questions. One is to Mr. Burnett. I agree with you. No accountability mechanism isn't, isn't the way to go. Is there any possibility that we can retool some of the existing account accountability mechanisms, such as the Committee on the Rights of the Child or the Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women to deal with that. And secondly, one of the things that I found really saddening about the whole SDG call for is the lack of a focus on user-led learning, whether it's child-centered learning or child-led learning or adolescent-led learning. There doesn't seem to be that concern coming out. Do you agree with me? Have I misread something? Thank you. The second gentleman was just sitting here in front. Oh, Yin, can you just pass on the micro? Hello, my name is Tiaz Bjornsson. I work with the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education. And uh, so obviously this will introduce my question. Um, to what extent, I mean, you're all development actors, and uh, to what extent is there a, a role for a rights-based approach, and to what extent is a rights-based approach in education actually making a positive difference so that we heat, hit these things like inclusion and whatever else, and to what extent is it an obstacle? Okay, thank you. like that question. And the gentleman in, in with the red shirt, please. I am not sure to be a gentleman, but I, my name is Boris Engelson. I am a professional latecomer. I came into the room when one of you was uh, stating that in the, I think, 60s through 80s, the main rationale for education was economic development and improving one's job and situation. It happens that in all countries, Originally, as far as I remember, the mystic of education had nothing to do with improving one's selfish situation. It was the mystic of the virtue of knowledge, Renaissance, and uh, uh, the age of enlightenment. And my question is, don't you think that in the past 50 years, 
education has become schizophrenic because it has to put in the same frame these two, in a way, contradictory uh, dynamics with different balance, of course, in Europe, in uh, Africa, etc. But isn't it a basic problem which completely destroy the consistency of the conceptual uh, vision? Okay, thank you for th those four questions, basically. Um, Gita, you want to have a start, maybe at the rights-based one? Or? Yeah, 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 the yeah. rights-based is... Uh, <clears throat> close to our work here. And I think um, it has made a huge difference with uh, South Africa and India and Pakistan now introducing the Right to Education Act. It opened, it. what it created is a demand side accountability. Parents now asking for a school to be built in their neighborhood, uh, which did not exist before. Uh, the entitlement of asking for a teacher in your neighborhood. So this is, uh, of course, it is very positive, and it should be adopted by many more countries. And in fact, I think that's one of the things we would want to do with NORAC, support these kind of um, initiatives. Yesterday, we also participated in a meeting in Paris where it was about acknowledging that the private sector is there to stay, and however, make developing guidelines on regulating them to be ethical and to be equitable and to be transparent and to have standards and not to be instead of free public education, but um, in, in a, so it makes all the difference what it has done to in, in India and in Pakistan with the numbers that have risen. And it has also changed the approach to education. It's rather than the government having to do everything, asking parents to come forward and, uh, and demand education. And I think it also helps, just a side effect that is not discussed enough, it has also helped with doing more bilingual education or education in the community languages of students because there is no way you can have state organized education in the national language to spread to every corner of a country unless you acknowledge the importance of minority languages or community languages. The obstacles. There were studies done, and I think Nick, you did a study on the, when the um, the fees were dropped in East Africa. Didn't you do studies on the uh, introduction of free education in, mm. in Kenya? And mm. So there is a period, I'm sure, where the class sizes will go up, uh, and some countries were better than others in handling the situation. Uh, but I would consider that um, as um, the obstacles are class sizes, that you don't have enough teachers. So that's why one of the three important means is to have more qualified teachers. So I think that has to go hand in hand, Other, otherwise you cannot accomplish that. And that would be a real obstacle. Um, but I think there's also, like in India, private philanthropy is stepping up now that there's a right to education, uh, engaging in um, building small schools, one teacher school. Mario? Um, well, maybe I could comment also on this rights and, and, and link that to the um, accountability question also. So I, I, I think that there are many interesting aspects of the, of, of the rights-based approach, and I broadly agree with, with what, what, what Gita said. And indeed, just to pick up on what she mentioned about the East African work. So, um, well, whatever you think about him today, uh, President Museveni, when he was a, a younger president in Uganda, was asked uh, when he um, removed the fees for uh, children in primary school, well, haven't you created a huge uh, quality problem for yourselves? And he said, well, yes, we have, but now it is everybody's problem. And that is, I think, a very uh, astute and important remark. So you are going to have, of course, as Gita said, you're going to have when you, that is a downside of rights. Suddenly you get swamped and you've got a problem. 
But you, isn't that the sort of problem, as the saying goes, that you want to have, even if it's temporally a, a very big problem? So that's one, I think. So I do think that this has been important, and the specific things uh, also in other countries, as Gita also referred to. I'm not so sure that what's going on um, uh, in India is to do with that. I think it's more got to do with the fact that uh, uh, corporate social responsibility is now compulsory, and um, uh, and uh, corporations are t typically looking uh, at both health and uh, education uh, as something to, to, to pay attention. But more broadly, I find that the kind of rights argument is usually put out there as Right, and, and it was a little bit implicit in some of the questioning, not quite explicit, as so rights versus economic development. Why do we, I've just actually, I've written about that several times and I cannot apparently persuade anybody. To me, this is not a versus thing. In fact, there is a, this is one of the few areas where rights and um, individual advancement and uh, national economic advancement and national social progress go together. So this is actually, uh, you know, pick your, pick, Pick whichever argument you want for whatever, whoever you want to persuade, I would say, because they're all, they are all, uh, they are all uh, valid. But the question now then is, well, what, what about accountability? Because there was a question uh, back there. And so one way of getting accountability is through enforcing rights. But that's for individuals, um, or at least for communities and so on. But there, we need to think about accountability at many, many levels. So we need to think about accountability to parents and communities, and the rights can be very helpful for that. We need to think about internal accountability within the education systems. How are um, teachers held uh, accountable? How are even children held accountable um, you know, for, for, lear for learning in, insofar as they have, they have some responsibility? All these sorts of things need, I think, to be aired and to be discussed a bit more. Um, a lot of the attention to accountability has been very much around uh, these international things and these international goals. Just as important, I think, is, as, uh, is, is accountability to communities and accountability, to, uh, and accountability within the education system, which in many, many countries has somewhat uh, collapsed. You used to have, you still have, in many African countries, a sort of... Um, in addition to school uh, heads, you have also district education officers, or you have inspectors in some places. And the whole relationship of accountability, who's really held accountable, um, is, uh, I think, not as strong as it was, uh, as, uh, well, 30 years ago or so. Uh, and I think, I'm not suggesting you should necessarily go back to the way it was, but I do think that you need to think about modern ways of using, of improving accountability. This is in addition to, you know, things that people talk about a lot, like absentee teachers and all that sort of thing. But I'm, assu I'm, I'm assuming that you can have mechanisms to deal with that sort of thing. And now we, then we want to focus really on what sort of a, accountability you want within your systems. So again, I would argue, same as I did on finance, that although I myself come from the international education world, that in fact much more important is what happens uh, domestically. And that's where we <clears throat> ought to put most attention. And that's where actually least attention seems to go, especially in a lot of the... Um, uh, academic and other writing, and I think it'd be, it would be good to redress that, that balance a bit. Thanks. Mario? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I guess on the issue of right-based right approach to education, um, I think that for me it's not a question of whether rights-based education is good or bad, but also the interpretation of what is rights-based education. No? And I mean, I come from this Latin American tradition of um, validating as much uh, economic, social, and cultural rights as political and civil rights, and you know, I think that the the focus on political and civil rights has been to the detriment of those dimensions, for whatever historical reasons. Um, so I think that that framework is helpful because it's internationally agreed. We have some international agreements, and it's been useful. Part of the problem of the human rights framework is that it does focus itself on the state. And as we know, many things have changed over the last three decades where states are not the only actors in the world. And it sometimes leads to then the blaming of the state for the failure of the access to education or quality education when there should be other actors. Historical reparations for colonialism, for slavery, for example. Where have all those debates gone, disappeared? Uh, the role of transnational actors and transnational businesses they also responsible if they're in Liberia extracting resources. They should also be responsible locally in those countries 
to provide support to local communities which live in the surroundings of those. Often these things are not happening. So there is a problem if you just focus on the state. I understand mm -hmm. that the legal cases have been important and those advancements, but I still think that we need a bigger framework uh, that can capture the multi-scalar, essentially, uh, levels of power that exist. And I think that on, then on the second question, which, of course, what I was talking about, actually, was not education, but education governance. Yeah? Because I think that we all agree that education is a very big thing, and it goes on in many spaces, from community organizations to social movements, uh, informal, non-formal, incidental. But I think that what we've seen from the 1960s onwards is human capital theory as a mechanism to justify funding in education became its rationale. And we fought about the role of education for economic growth at the det detriment of education for citizenship, for socialization, for community. And we paid a price for that because we have citizens that are skilled but asocial, you know, acultural alien from, you know, there are many issues of this and we see that education actually, there is a concern now for social cohesion within the international community. I'm working on projects now with teachers around teachers and social cohesion in South Africa, in Rwanda, in other countries, because states are realizing <coughs> that they need to work with their uh, children around identity, around citizenship, around inclusion, because there are lots of alienation going on in our society for obvious reasons. So I think that uh, bringing back a more holistic approach to education uh, would be very important. But we're running against a trend where everything that is being measured has nothing to do with the social side of education. It's all related to uh, targets, related to the economies, and there is very little indicators that say, okay, if I go into a school, are the children smiling? Do they like their teacher? Not do they just get high marks in education or in mathematics, but what are those other skills? We don't measure those things. It's difficult, I understand that. But it's also about priorities. And you can see that at the, in the current round, the measurement uh, is rooted much more towards the economy than those broader social uh, objectives. Okay, thank you. Gita, you want to add something here? Actually, I was so surprised yesterday in, uh, at, as a discussion of Andrea Schleicher, because PISA obviously measures do students like the subject and do students, are they motivated? Okay. So one of the findings is, for instance, that the, in the US they are not doing ex well, but they like science, whereas in some countries, <laughs> so, and some countries where they are doing really well, the students in science, they don't like the topic, but so, just imagine a future where people that don't like science do science and become uh. professionals. But the, I wanted to address the uh, comment of the colleague, uh, Philip O'Brien. Um, actually, PISA does measure kinds, you know, problem solving, working in groups, global citizenship is the next mm -hmm. focus of the next round of PISA. But the problem is, because they do not, do not link students with the teacher, they don't know what, if it was the effect of the teacher or what the effect was of the outcome of what the, um, uh, the student performance or assessment. And what would be needed would be much more qualitative studies at the classroom level to get into the depth of pedagogical question, which tends to be forgotten in the whole discussion on learning outcomes. We're running out of time. I would still propose to take one more question if it's very urgent. A brûlant. Madame. Madame. Hello, I'm Delia Mammon. I'm president of Graines de Paix, which is an NGO based here in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva, and that does uh, international education development in the form of uh, trainings and uh, materials resources. And uh, my question to all three of you is um, regarding 4.7, 
which is the one that concerns us as an NGO the most. Um, you have not talked about the items that are inside and how these, uh, these elements that are requested are in fact the means to achieve quality education. And I'd like to hear you on these subjects. <laughs> so. Uh, well, seven is global citizen. Uh, citizen yes, and education. it's a few other things. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's, I'll be more specific because uh, I've lost you. But uh, to con continue on the conversation on how do you measure uh, children smiling? How do you measure the relationship between teacher and child? How do you measure uh, the child's ability to study better? What are the factors that will okay. make that psychologically a child studies better? One reaches the element of, um, of peace culture education. And people think that peace culture education is about teaching not to do war, but peace culture education is about emotional intelligence skills yes. and psychosocial skills. I was asking for a short burning question. <laughs> so we, I want a very short burning answer here. Yeah. Field. You're the expert on peace, peace and war. Um, well, I mean, look, my, my experience of um, global initiatives uh, to promote peace, peace education, <coughs> these kind of things, is that precisely because they're global, they tend to be generic, they tend to be standardized, and they tend to promote a certain set of values that they perceive are universal. And they often don't connect to the local realities, what I would call living rights, the living rights of people in communities. So um, I've recently done a paper around uh, a, a big program of UNICEF, which was called Emerging Issues, which was implemented in Sierra Leone and is being implemented in different, different parts of the world, which essentially reproduced a range of generic skills around learning your rights, learning to live peacefully, but didn't deal at all with the local realities of Sierra Leone children, the legacies of the war, the realities of segregation, uh, the realities of their situation. Uh, and so often my feeling is, is that um, peace education looks nice, but doesn't really get its hands dirty with the diversity that exists in the world. And until it starts from below and emerges out of communities who have gone through conflicts or are on the verge of conflicts, then it tends to, and I think this is the critique now of the global citizenship movement, uh, the Brookings work and the range of things that are being set up is that it looks very nice produced in the United States or in the UK or in different parts of the world, but does it really connect to local uh, students? Well, I would say it's more than just about how you do it, but it's about who's doing it and who produces those materials and whose stories are being told and whose version of history is being talked about. Yeah? Was it really the youth of Sierra Leone that caused the conflict or were they a logical occurrence of uh, a highly unequal society that marginalized youth and regularly uh, humiliated them? So I think that uh, that's part of the problem of the way peace is done. Uh, is that it's done from quite a privileged position. I don't want us to get into dialogue. I mean, we were happy to do, pursue this discussion, mm -hmm. but we can do it outside of this room. Nick, you just wanted to add one So I just, because uh, you were short on optimistic remarks, I, I would say that, um, you know, so <laughs> education, you know, to grossly oversimplify is, is, is about, you know, cognitive stuff, it's about psychosocial uh, transferable stuff, and it's about values. So we, we figured out more or less how to measure the cognitive stuff with problems. Uh, we are figuring out how to do the uh, transferable stuff, and we are only just be beginning on the values stuff. And uh, so I wouldn't be quite so negative. I mean, I think the very fact that it's getting attention, even though some of the attention is misguided, which I, I agree with Mario a lot of it is, doesn't mean that it's actually a bad thing. There is a sort of progress, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think, and, and in time, I'm optimistic that, in fact, we will figure out ways to uh, measure this. But you don't expect it to be clean and tidy and happen, you know, in two weeks' time. Right. Peter, you have your final word, or you have a, a final slot here to, to So you don't want as, to as give the wish. floor to Clementina asking if, the last question? If you wish, I just wanted to say the I, last I, question, that's yes. your call. I think this global citizenship discussion opens up a whole new world that didn't exist before and is, uh, the fact that it's a priority will 
change many things in terms of values and solidarity mm -hmm. and togetherness and unity and all these things. But Clementina should have the last question and then uh, former director then, of IB UNESCO. And then we'll wrap up. Mm -hmm. Hello, Clementina Cedo. I'm the director of Webster University and former director of the International Bureau of Education of UNESCO here in Geneva. The, um, first of all, it's great to have this type of discussions here in Geneva. <laughs> I, and I'm looking forward to work with Gita to, to further develop this. Um, I was just, I just wanted to make a comment at the end to the, to the, the change of the first countries that appear, that appear in Pisa and to see what, what are your, your, your views with regard to that. It's really interesting if you see Pisa some years ago, you had Finland very high. You had, um, the, 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 the countries have changed order and, and quite interestingly, you have now Shanghai, you have now, I mean, some Asian countries, you have the European, Central European countries much lower, although they were not on the top. You had before more the Scandinavian countries there. Um, what has changed? I mean, at certain point in change, the, the measurement of equity. And, and that seems to also bring up some of the countries that are there. And it was one of the reasons why Finland was quite high. The, but now we see some countries which are not uh, okay. equitable on the top. So just a question. <laughs> this is a very long uh, answer, so I'm not going in there. But this is a really big question. But just to two points. One is out of school factors matter. Many of these countries have extensive tutoring, private tutoring after school. And they have a unified entrance exam at the university. So in order to get into that exam, they, there, there is a test literacy that is being developed. The other thing, the positive thing is, however, that they have a more equitable distribution of qualified teachers. Teachers are dispatched to teach in a school, they don't have a choice. So it's not that rural schools end up with less qualified teachers. So they have a rotational principle like in Japan, and in, uh, but also in Singapore that teachers are dispatched to teach in a school and that makes a big difference. This is, but it's much more complex than that. Okay. I will have opportunity to pursue this discussion. So I would like to thank you again for joining this, this, this session this inaugural talk and, and panel discussion. I think the room is full. Uh, we did quite well. We had Jean Ziegler as a competitor just next door. And we'll have Angelina Jolie tomorrow here. Fortunately, she was not here today, so otherwise it would have been more difficult. But to invite you also to, to stay connected to NORAC. Uh, we're part of, of the Graduate Institute. We're part of, of the family. Even if we're not located in this building, we're at the Rue Rothschild. Uh, but you're all most welcome to stay attuned to what we do through our website, through our blog, and also through the teaching that, that Gita has now started here. And we look forward to building an interesting future for the international education space, particularly here also in Geneva, and building on the international Geneva that we have as a surrounding and which offers many opportunities also to connect with other sectors beyond the education and training sector, go beyond a silo and try to spread out. So thank you again. Yes, other conferences will be uh, continued. Yes, there's a number of events already planned and you find more information uh, on the table in front. Maybe one we can announce is the philanthropy and education topic, which was mentioned here. Uh, and that we think is an important element since it is uh, new actors emerging in this space. What does it mean? With what agendas? With what objectives? So we'll be happy to keep you informed, stay tuned, and look out for what Norex is doing over the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you.